It's a common enough sight, a life in danger. A man on night shift stumbles against a machine. A woman wakens with agonizing chest pains. A car skids and crashes. Whatever the reason, the end result is a common enough sight. All too often, it's the prelude to the end of a life, to the easy act of dying. For all the millions who believe devoutly in an afterlife, a life after death, this sort of thing can well be no more than a prelude, a staging point on the way to an immortal hereafter. But what about the others? The ones who see dying as an intermission, those who believe in a life after life. What about those who claim a previous existence here on Earth? The ones like these. Oh, my chest. Oh, my chest. Oh, I was freeze and cold. I laid down on the couch. I wasn't feeling too good. And I took a chill. I was coughing. I died. There are people who are alive now and who, under hypnosis, claim that they have been dead. Try to pick my body up to get it moving. So we could go and find Papa. But I wouldn't move. It felt cold and funny. I found myself being drawn away from there. No reason to stay. It's like I'm being lifted. And I'm being drawn, drawn towards a very bright light. And I just wanted to go to the light. And we went fast towards the light. And when we came out at the end, White, bright. It's so green. The greenest green I've never seen green so green. And the flowers look so bright. Like they've all been polished. I'm in a garden. There are people sitting nearby and then there's someone coming to meet me I want to know what's happened what's happened and she took me to a big white building she tells me to rest he smiled at me and said you died sweetheart you died, you died. And went where? To heaven? The classic picture of a beautiful place and a golden afterlife? Or into some limbo, a pause, a breath of death between one mortal life and another, before reincarnation? I didn't believe in reincarnation. Uh, and the, the prospect of doing research about it and finding out for myself if for no one else an answer one way or another to me was um, very interesting. But Jenny Green, mother of two, a migrant to Australia from England. Until she began hypnotherapy, she had never thought she had a past life. I suppose different attitudes to things, perhaps I look at things slightly differently now. Here we go. And this is Helen Pickering, housewife and mother. In deep hypnotic trance, she appears to relive the life of a man. Dr. James Burns of Scotland. Would you like a cool drink? 
and another Australian housewife is Cynthia Henderson. Under hypnosis, she says she was Amélie de Chauville of Normandy in France 200 years ago. And Gwen MacDonald, who's never been out of her home state of New South Wales, but who, in trance, claims to have lived as Rose Duncan of Somerset, England, at the time of the American War of Independence. Four ordinary women sharing one extraordinary thing, the feeling that they've lived before. Now, how can you prove that? We decided to try something never done before. We would take each woman back physically to where she said she had lived an earlier life and film and record what happened with witnesses. But why these women? None of them claimed big things. None said she'd been famous or notorious, only that there were memories in detail. The man who helped them remember is Peter Ramster, a hypnotherapist with seven years of intensive research into reincarnation, an interest stemming from his work in the broad field of analytical therapy. From more than a thousand case histories, they were selected because they're ordinary people claiming ordinary past lives and because their stories could be checked. I actually got onto the research program when he discovered that uh, I apparently had a past life in Scotland as a doctor and he was most interested in researching that because it could be verified. Well, I've got mixed feelings. I'm, I'm not worried about it at all, but I feel a little bit excited and it'll be absolutely wonderful and fantastic if we do dig up any information that can prove to me, to me as much as to anybody else, that uh, I really was there once. I just can't wait to get there to see. Um, if everything is exactly as I see it in my mind, this is the part I'm, I'm looking forward to. Half of me is interested and would like to see it, and the other half of me says, no, uh, I'm not sure. You know, maybe, maybe better not. We weren't sure either, but we knew that we wanted to find out. The first step was to examine exhaustively the stories the four women told under hypnosis and then to take a long stride ahead of them and go to Europe. And there we began the complex, disturbing and often frustrating search through old documents and fading manuscripts and crumbling registers, the painstaking detective work of accurate research. We wanted to track and pin down whatever facts we could find before flying our subjects out of Australia. They were excited and nervous as we made the final checks, careful and extensive checks to be sure they had not, in this life, traveled where we were going. We were taking them a long way, more than 15,000 miles to the far side of the world. Peter Ramster gave each of our subjects the post-hypnotic suggestion that she would recognize the place of her earlier life and he was to travel with us all the way. Jenny Green had never been to Germany. Cynthia Henderson had never been to France. Helen Pickering had been to the United States, but not to Britain and Gwen MacDonald had lived all her life in New South Wales, Australia. This journey was to take us and them into a territory which needs no passports and where the borderline is between life and life again. City of Alençon in France. This fine modern building houses historical records. And here, work was begun by an independent witness, a devout Catholic, skeptical about reincarnation. This is Antoine Le Breton, and he was given tapes and transcripts of what Cynthia Henderson had said of her past life while she was under hypnosis in Australia, guided by them and doubting. Could you tell me where you live? The chateau. Where's that? The chateau, do you feel? And where was it that you married? The cathedral, near Fleur. What was the name of the man that you married? Saint Clair. What was his full name? Jean Pierre Victoire. He wants you to tell me about your children. 
you have any? Two children. Maria. And Pierre. There was no record of any of them that he could find. No available record of Amélie de Chauville, nor of a marriage to Jean-Pierre Victoire Saint Clair. The Bretons Dutch were reinforced, but he went on hunting, spurred by the mystery of the recordings from Australia, by the voice of an Australian woman who, in trance, spoke colloquial French. While he worked, we took Cynthia to France for the critical steps in this experiment. Her story told of two places, a chateau near Fleur in Normandy where she said she'd lived, and another which she used to visit at Servan, about 75 kilometers away. And this, she said, was a manor house with a large coach gate in a U-shaped courtyard and near a chapel with a strange tower. First, though, a simple test to see whether she spoke or understood French without the aid of hypnosis. Few women can resist the sort of bargain Cynthia was being offered, but smiling, and not understanding, she rejected the chance. <laughs> we were satisfied that her French was, at the very best, rudimentary. But in a hypnotic state, in deep trance, there was a marked difference. Oui. Her answers to Le Breton's questions were not fully fluent, but what was plain was that she understood what was being asked, even when she answered in English. The most striking feature are the doors in the porch. That's the first thing you see when you come down the drive. What about any feature windows? Is there any win anything, any windows that are distinctive? It has beautiful windows at the side, the opposite end to the tower. With such detailed information from Cynthia, the next logical step was to see where her directions would take us. Go past the church for a while, and we come to a road. The big road goes between Ruin and Saint Michel. We drove on highways and country roads and lanes unknown to Le Breton and certainly not known to us. Go right there for about an hour. Cynthia seemed to be increasingly aware of her surroundings, in the past as well as in the present, and we moved deeper into the French countryside. It starts, it starts to go up after you leave Fleur. The road goes on the top of the hill. You can look down on, mainly on the left side. You can see woods and trees, fields, and then over the top of a hill, and then turn left down to the chateau. I think that's the chateau in there. That looks like it's wall. And then the directions became precise. If you go a bit further along, you'll find a gate and an opening. We drive in.
The gate and its porter's lodge are now the entrance to a public park, and one pays to get in. Beyond the transistorized music of the 20th century, and as the green country began to close about us, we could feel the tension building in Cynthia. Antoine Le Breton simply drove where she told him, and we waited to see what would happen. Amélie de Chauville was alive again, alive in the 18th century, among the ruins left in the 20th by the U.S. Tactical Air Force. This is such a shock. After all this time. This was the Chateau Cerisi Belle Etoile. If you remember where we're standing at any time. This is the main door, the hall. Over here is sort of a reception room. It had big windows over there with coloured glass in it. Oh. Around here, this led to the servants' quarters. Down here. There's the kitchens down here. There was a floor here and bedrooms looking out up there. There, there was a ceiling here uh, above yeah, those windows the and there's right the bedrooms above here. Yeah. now I feel very satisfied now because when we first started doing the regression I learned about it uh, I kept having doubts thinking it might be my imagination but of course now I know it wasn't and it sort of made me feel relieved because I you know, I just couldn't even though I, I did believe it there's always a fraction of doubt there for Cynthia there was relief in this visit or was it a return for Le Breton there was amazement Dans ce lieu, c'est difficile, c'est un travail qui est... C'est une recherche qui est passionnante, qui est amusante, mais qui est, qui est également passionnante. C'est-à-dire que c'est un peu à la, à la limite du crédit, mais de la croyance, un peu ce qui est un, tout à fait différent. Ce sont deux niveaux euh, mentaux et spirituels qui sont différents. Il y avait plus à venir. Rolling through the flat countryside west of Fleur, Cynthia guided us past the spired and looming bulk of Le Mont Saint-Michel and towards a favourite place of Amélie's, the manor which she called a chateau. Turn right. Here we are. Turn right here. And again, her directions were precise. Correct. This road winds around a bit and it should bear right. 
after a while. And the, then the driveway into the chateau will be on the right hand side. Now keep going. There's the river and we go round to the right. See? Is it the river there? Well, it's a little stream. See, it was just a little stream. It was. There you are. Now we go around here. See it round to the right. Oh, gee. Oh. Oh, there it is. That's it. Again, and it was to be a common factor with all our subjects, again there was the sudden shock to the senses, and there were tears. And for the once alive Amélie de Chauvier in Cynthia Henderson's mind, there was after 200 years the revisiting of a much-loved place. this place. Oh, I used to have such lovely times here. Oh. Oh. The statue was in the wall, but the wall's been knocked down where it was. It was on the right, but that part of the wall's not there. And that, I presume, is where the coach is. That's right, yeah, they used to go straight through. And where was the other statue you said? There was another one you showed us in the chapel. In the chapel. Can we yeah, go and just have a look at yeah, that? we'll have a look at the chapel. Right. Go through this way. It was well into the late afternoon when Antoine Le Breton persuaded the local priest away from his coffee. At Le Breton's urging, the curé hunted for and found an old pamphlet about the history of his church little dubious at first about what we were doing, but intrigued enough to help when he was sure we were in earnest. We had Cynthia's recorded descriptions of this chapel with a strange tower, recollections under hypnosis of a statue of the Madonna and Child against an outside wall, a wall pulled down long since, of a wheel of candles suspended from the ceiling, but there's now electricity. But. She had told of something more unusual in a French church of this kind. She had spoken of rows of wooden pews. A dark carved wood, shiny. I think they're made of oak. They're very dark. The tiles run from the back when you first go in right across. And then they run all the way down the aisle, right up to the altar. Bluey grey or blue. Does he know if there was ever a Madonna and Child statue in the wall outside? Ah oui, il y en a plusieurs. En particulier, une statue en pierre qui a été retrouvée, qui a été rapportée ici, qui est montée sur un pédestal. There is an old statue of the Papa. Est-ce que c'est une, est-ce qu'elle porte un nom particulier? Is uh, the mother with her child? Yes. Is there a font on the left-hand side made of stone, about this high, mm -hmm. this big? A font? Oui. They are very old. Uh, the font. Uh, Was there ever a very large gold cross or crucifix? Oui. In the church? Yes, a very, a very large. Yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes
so was the stone font, and it was on the left, not centrally placed as is usual. The statue of the Madonna was entirely expectable, as were the other adornments, but there were those old dark wooden pews, which were not expectable at all. So, a first experiment, made with an independent witness, a deeply religious man, who began as a skeptic, and who had been shown things and told things which had shaken him, and which he admitted he had no way of explaining. Yes, uh, I think for myself it's uh, a strange experience. During these, uh, uh, this week, uh, this last week, since uh, <clears throat> yeah, I... Uh, can't predict uh, a lot of things in advance. She found the castle, uh, she found the Grand Manoir à Cerveau near Le Mont Saint Michel, and there is a lot of coincidences. When uh, she was uh, under hypnosis, uh, she can speak French, good French, not very, not a lot of French, but uh, it was uh, French without. Uh, accent without, uh, yes, it's, it's very strange. But to think something about, uh, about this, it's very difficult. <laughs> I can't explain it. It makes you think, doesn't it? Yes, I can't explain. Mm. Neither can I. In Pickering, as with each of our subjects, the starting point was always in the facts of the story told by each of them in deep trance. What's your full name? James Archibald Burns. I don't like Archibald. Why don't you like Archibald? Because it's my father's name. And I guess I never really liked the man. I don't think I ever saw him laugh. He was... He, he did laugh sometimes, but not in front of me. Only when he was with his drinking mates. Just let yourself run again. Now you'll move to the time when you were in practice. I want you to describe to me where, this, where your practice is. It's in Blagari. Blagari is a small town in southeast Scotland. Dr. James Burns, according to Helen Pickering, had been in successful practice there, knew the town intimately, drank at a favorite tavern, and was a man of some substance and standing in the community. When we drove into Blagari, Helen had no idea where we'd taken her. We hadn't discussed it, and we blindfolded her well away from the edge of the town and without her seeing a signpost. We were to meet our witnesses later, but we took this chance to film and record Helen's reactions as we stopped at an easy landmark for anyone knowing Blagari. Like most places, it seemed changed since the middle of last century, and Helen had nothing to go on but the pictures in her mind, the mental images left behind by someone else in some other time. She seemed to be in some doubt, not at once recognizing what she was seeing, not apparently able to relate her trance memories of an older Scotland to the quiet bustle of the place we'd suddenly shown her. We'd come into the town on a road unfamiliar to Helen. The places she knew best were on the other side. It wasn't until we walked away from the bridge that she was, at once, able to orient herself. on a corner of the street. The street runs up to the square. There's a, a grassy area in the middle of the square. And the road runs around both sides. Now, where do you think the pub was? Over here. 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 Over
They've got a piano. What sort of pain is it, do you know? It's brown ale. But I prefer brandy. I drink a lot of brandy. The pub, old enough though it is, was new to Helen, part of the pattern of change which the tread of time always brings with it. They look the same or no, different? No, completely different. It's all different? Completely different. Completely. Yep. Yeah, right. Well, I love these Where is your practice from the tavern? Just up the road. Just a 50 yard walk. And where's your practice? Over on that far corner, over there. Oh, yes. That white yes. building, but it's completely changed. That's not as it was. That building's different too now, yes. isn't it? Yes. Right. Can I come and have a look? Yeah, I'd like to. It's a white building. There's a window at the front and a door to the right. And I should go inside. It's on two levels. There's a, a small room. As you go in the door. And then you go up two steps. Through another door. Into the surgery. What's wrong? Changed. The buildings came right up to the square. In fact, I think the buildings came right up to here. They might have come round, but I think they came round in a circle and came back right. onto this road. All right. According to the old records, the surgery and all the nearby buildings had either been remodelled or pulled down many years ago. There were new shop fronts, new buildings, an entire new road, and no clear way to confirm what Helen had said. Yet she seemed so sure. And some things could be checked from the old local records and minute books housed now below ground in a county library. And there we find traces and reminders indeed of James Burns, doctor of medicine, well known in Blagari's civic affairs. I was very respected. I could sign on behalf of people. I was the justice of the peace. They also agreed to express their appreciation of the services which he had rendered to the village since his residence in the locality. And then to Aberdeen, a port for many centuries, and these days one of the world's busiest, thick with the traffic of North Sea oil and the tankers and traders of all the oceans. This is the city in which Helen claimed she had been a student of medicine as the young James Burns. Are with us in Aberdeen, two impartial witnesses. Anne Gordon is from the History Department in the University of Aberdeen. And Joanna Buchan is a young reporter from the city's FM broadcaster, North Sound Radio. And again, on this day, Helen's view was at first restricted to what she could see in her mind. We took her deliberately to a part of Dockland, from which, if she had lived before as James Burns, she should be able to find her way when the blindfold was removed. She should be able to lead us to the place she'd spoken of and even drawn for us, the old College of Medicine, Marshall College, a little over a mile away. Some parts of Aberdeen still retain the flavor of the past, of the time of James Burns, but even those places have seen some change. And yet there was enough, enough for Helen to feel familiarity. Um. I want to go around there. Where? Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Um, no, it's around here. Around here. Here. Right. You can see the bay from the back of the dorms. There's always a mist on the bay. And in the early morning, when the sun's coming up, the mist is pink. And you can see the masts of the sailing boats in the harbour. 
three masters and two masters. We might be getting close to the seaman's mission. Let's have a look at this building. So familiar. They're all along here, all the way down. And the mission, Seaman's mission, yeah. as far as I can yeah. remember, was up here on a corner. We checked, of course, and to our witnesses' great surprise, Helen Pickering was right. An Australian woman new to Scotland had told them a thing they didn't know about their own city. The old Seaman's mission had once stood exactly where she had said. Is that saying something? If oh, you're not no. sure what you're saying. No, no, well... I'm trying to remember the, the, uh, what I could see from the top of the college. I've done those drawings last night. Right. Helen's talented oh, drawing of the old College of Medicine was done weeks oh, before in Sydney. Right. This is the College of Medicine in Aberdeen. That's the back or the front of it? That's the main entrance here. And it's a big courtyard. And what, what's behind there? You know, sir? Well, if you look out the top windows, in an easterly direction, you can see the port of Aberdeen. Right. And that was where the library and lecture theatre were. We find in Aberdeen an old and elaborate drawing of the Marshall College of Medicine as it had once been. But even when this drawing was done, it was after James Burns time, and there had been many alterations inside and out. Aberdeen, Helen began to lead us past this building. Fantastic old building. There's been so much new building that it wasn't until she reached this entrance that Helen knew. This feels very familiar. Does it? Really? Oh, yes. Getting strong feelings here, aren't you? Well, I am, but my goodness, it's, it's changed as well. What has? A lot. Is, do you, what do you think this is? Well, this was all grass before, and that tower wasn't there. But, uh... What do you think this was? The College of Medicine. Can we go in and have a little look? Yes. This was all grass. The atmosphere inside took hold of Helen at once, as though the changes outside had left her unprepared for the sudden surge of familiarity. Oh, wow. Very strange feeling. I'd like to go up those stairs. Can we go up? The echoes under that vaulted roof seemed almost to draw her upwards. Anne Gordon and Joanna Buchan and our team all caught in a feeling of remembering as our footsteps rang and echoed. Can you remember me saying that you could look down on the entrance from the stairs? I think I do. I feel like I've seen a ghost. Mm. Towards the top, Helen seemed to be leading us all through a curtain of memory, a curtain she was brushing aside. There's the library. I said there was a library. That's right. I've got to sit down. It's not a library, 
It's a museum now. It houses many memories of the past, but then so does Helen Pickering. You see, in the days of James Burns, this was the college library. Let's go down here. Passage that runs the length of the building. Let's try. Wow, get a look in here. Helen led us up and down through the warren of the old parts of the building, telling us of passages and hallways long ago blocked up or pulled away. Look at this doorway. Always taking us towards places she told us of in advance, pointing out where changes had been made from upper corridors to old stone cellars. That's why it's all changed. Well, let's find our way back out of here. Well, this is all the original. What's on the other side of the building? Well, the building is not... doesn't have a straight wall at the back. There, it goes out, I think, in a T. Oh, wow, look. Well, that T you described it. Yep. That wasn't there. That top floor, they've added that. Right. And it finished there, because that's all new. All of that's new. Because from that... that yes, that's, yeah. that's all new. Because from up at that top window, you could look right across. So actually, when she drew the drawing of two floors at the back going out to there, stopping there, she actually drew the correct thing. Yeah, that's right. Right. It was plain that Anne Gordon and Joanna Buchan were something more than surprised at what Helen had told them and shown them. Well, I have been very moved indeed by him, Helen's feeling about the place, especially when she went into this section, you know, of the building and sort of realized where the staircases were, where the corridors were, which I didn't know about. Knows more about it than I do, and I spent five years at this university. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, I yeah. spent five years running out in this building, mm. and I had no idea there were all those those um, works underneath, they all sell a bit. Right. David Gordon is the only man in the world who knows what the old College of Medicine was like. He's a very practical man who works in the field of oil sciences, but his passion is local history. He wrote a postgraduate paper on the history of the college and meticulously collected every existing plan and drawing from the building's conception to its last restoration. He is the expert Except perhaps for Helen Pickering. Great. Well, I believe that um, you could help me with some history about the old College of Medicine. Yes, I will certainly try. Right. But can you remember, I think you remember, about this building in the 1830s, Helen? Yes, 1830s. 1830. Any particular date that oh. you can remember? Just 1830s. Early 1830s. Early 1830s. Right. Yes. Uh, it was a quadrangle and the main entrance was at the center of the quadrangle but at the right the right hand wing of the quadrangle should yeah. face the main entrance was a chapel yes. and that ran down on the right hand side the building itself was three stories tall and across the top floor were the dormitories what yes. i'm saying now is not there yes. now yes. but it's how it was there's also a second staircase that is, as you face the main entrance, there is another staircase that is in the building that goes up, it winds back and up, back mm -hmm. and up to the top floor. And that's a stone staircase. And that's... That is not there now because we went right through the building. And it's all new. They've obviously yeah. taken down the whole of the interior. Yes. Because there's just nothing there that resembles I know, it at all. That's part of the alterations that were made. And you give quite a good explanation of the college, as it was by Archibald Simpson. Right. I think I could, we could have a look at some of the original architect's drawings, which we may be of some interest. David Gordon had been most careful not to let Helen see any of his papers or plans or drawings until she'd answered the pointed questions he wanted to ask. She answered them all, and to his satisfaction, starting with the position of that long-vanished staircase. If you look on this one here, 
Yes. That's a staircase you're looking at. Takes you to the, the east wing and right. the other side, the west wing. Right. So if we look on this plan here, that is the opening here. Right. Which goes to the cloisters. Right. And then this is the staircase you're talking about. So that's the staircase now. there, and that's and no then, longer there. That's no longer there. Right, well, no. that's why we couldn't find that's it. That's right. Well, Without having seen any marked floor plans, without ever having seen the original drawings, it was abundantly clear that Helen knew things about a building long ago altered from its shape in the 1830s, that she knew where an old staircase had once curved, where ancient walls had once stood. It was clear that she wasn't guessing, that she knew. From this upper landing here, in the main centre here of the building, yes. was it possible to look down into that main assembly hall? Yes, I, I, it is, or it was, definitely. Right, and that is a lecture theatre to the left? That is lecture theatre, indeed. Right, yes. fine. Great. That's right. I wonder if you could uh, tell me if you were uh, at a tutorial in a discussion in the museum or the library and you wanted to wash your hands, Yes. Where would you go? Is there a ladies' room? Oh, oh. men's room, please. Uh, men's room, yes, that's right. From the second floor level here, yes. uh, you'd go along a small corridor and it was on the right, this, this side. How would it possibly? Let's have a look at this. Here we are. From the main entrance, right, the museum, and on the right, up some steps to the right and off the center's room. There yes. it is. Yeah. There's a closet there. Right. Yes, there is. Are you satisfied that she knows more about this building than a person uh, is likely to know who's never seen the building? It would seem more than coincidental, quite frankly. It may be inexplicable to, in my terms, you know, but uh, certainly uh, from what she's uh, discussed with me, before she saw these plans, or even knew these plans existed. Your paper on this, David, was never published. There's no way anybody could walk into a library and pick up a copy. No, the only place there will be a copy of my work is in the Open University Archives. And uh, I don't think that Helen has been anywhere near the Open University Archives. She needs long arms. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. Australia. <laughs> Indeed, that's right. Especially never having been out of Australia. So, a second experiment, and a woman from today's Australia, in Scotland for the first time, confronting the one man alive who could confirm with the evidence the things she claimed to have seen in an earlier life. Like all our subjects, Helen Pickering had no conscious knowledge of that past. It was only under hypnosis that she and they became aware of those traces and reminders of what had gone before. Of deeper and deeper. Jenny Green is an eminently sensible and stable woman, a housewife and mother living in the quiet suburbia of Sydney, Australia. There was no reason for us or her to suspect what was going to happen when she was in trance before our camera. And what did happen surprised and disturbed us all. Fräulein, Fräulein, he's spousy to father. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Suddenly she had taken us back only a short time, only 40 years, and to Nazi Germany, to a time when, as a teenage girl, the terror had struck her family. Can you remember very, very clearly where you were born? Across that, in the flat of father's shop. What town's that in? What city? In Dusseldorf. And what's your, what was your name in that life? Dorothy Hellman. And what was your father's name in that life? Joseph Hellman. Your mother's name? Sarah Hellman. Once Jenny had led us onto this new and unexpected track, we had to follow. We brought in a German interpreter, and our first attempt to talk to Jenny in German 
led her to break out of her trance at once in a mixture of fear and anger. The Hallman family of Dusseldorf had been Jewish. I'm going to get the girl to talk to you again. And I'd like you to either answer or tell me that you can hear her. Wie heißt du? Kannst du Deutsch verstehen? Hilda Bronte. Was hast du gesagt? Der Haut rast an. Und komm in die Hälfte wehen. Und da weißt du nein. Du musst ein Kino mal ein Ding. Wo ist denn das? The language meant nothing to our German interpreter, or to us, or to the university linguistics experts who heard it. But it seemed to carry the sound of danger, and there'd been enough of that in the other life in Jenny's mind. You were taking us to a village for Jews to live in. What was the village? Often. It's a big What was that? We cooked and cleaned. You wash clothes. They were the clothes of people who had been and gone. He told us they'd taken them somewhere else. But they wouldn't leave their clothes. My friend, Frida. She just asked why the clothes kept coming. They beat her. They made us all watch while they beat her and kicked her. And we were to ask questions. We were just awoke. They wouldn't let us help her. She just died. She just died in the dirt and they wouldn't let us help her. You're coming away from that. You're coming away from that. The depth of Jenny's emotion was all too apparent. In what she was saying, there was all the horror of the Holocaust, and we were all affected by it. It took a little while for Peter Ramster to quieten her again, to be sure she was deep in trance. And then we looked for a way back into some less harrowing part of that past life. Jenny had said she had lived in Dusseldorf, and we located a tourist map of the city. She was told that, still in trance, she would be able to see and read the map clearly and point out to us exactly where her family's house and shop had stood. Once you're deep enough to stay in trance, I want you just to open your eyes and look at the map and tell me where you live. Up the Rhine, Rheinhof Square, Rheinhof, for school, for the shop. After I wake you up, you're going to remember that map very clearly. Everything you showed me, you'll remember very clearly. Where you lived on the map, you'll remember very clearly. You remember it awake as well as you do asleep. Once I wake you up, I want you to show me on the map where it was that you lived. Waking up one, waking up two, three.
How do you feel? All right. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, show me on the map. I can't see. You can't see because you haven't got your glasses on. Hey, just hang on a second, we'll get your glasses. Where's the glasses? Over when you look at the map? Mm -hmm. Could you see it clearly? Mm -hmm. Right, you could. Under trance, you could see it clearly without your glasses. When we woke you up, we had to give you the glasses. Oh, oh stupid eyes work after all. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Weeks later in Dusseldorf, John Abbott joined us as our independent witness. He's a level-headed Australian writer and researcher now studying law in London. Jenny, in a strange city in a foreign land, led us without hesitation. She was taking us to find her childhood home. That's not it. Can I go to the next one along? Her father had been a jeweller, and Jenny had been very close to him. And now, in modern Dusseldorf, she nearly ran to re-establish that old and loving tie. She took us almost without hesitation, not to Karlstrasse, the street name she'd used, but to Kirchfeldstrasse. But the square's not there. It's all changed. Most surely it had changed. teeth of World War II had bitten deeply into Dusseldorf. When the scars had healed, the body of the city carried a different shape. Two-thirds of it had been ravaged and rebuilt. But in Jenny's mind, Dorothy Hellman felt she was where she had lived as a teenager when the terror struck her family. Yes, yes, that was where the shop was. Hospitals up there. It was just all houses and this was all cobbled. It was just a narrow street path in there. There were houses and that went round into a circle. The circle may once have been there, but nothing else matched. Not even the recollections of an old neighbor who'd lived there for half a century and remembered no Hellmans in that street. The following day saw the search for the hospital of which Jenny had spoken, in trance and on the spot. Yes. All right, which way? From here. Ah, uh, in that way, that direction, right. in there. That's it, that's the park, and the hospital's behind it. It's a short on this side, and it goes long down that side. The, the main part of the, was on the, uh, this right-hand face. a wrecky old time. Hmm. These were all here, these trees. Yeah, they're all there. This is the, where the hospital was. The main entrance was just about here. And all these trees were here. This was all park. The main, the main door was about here. And it had a big, big heavy lintel on the top. And the doorways were round. They went round, but they were all fluted. They weren't straight. And it went in to, to big doors on the inside. Her description was detailed. 
But these were apartment blocks and post-war. She was positive that the hospital was not near a railway line, that there'd been a park there. Had the place been so badly bombed that it was pulled down? We went to a pre-war map of the city to check its position. And she pointed up this street and said, right, that's where the park is and, that's, uh, and the hospital is just behind the park. Well, we came to the end of the street because there wasn't a park, there's a railway underpass there, which was a bit disturbing. We went underneath the railway and along this street here, Farberstrasse, which looks like a much bigger street in this 1937 map. This is where she said the hospital was, in this area here. Right. Uh, big, big place, big buildings, and a gate here somewhere, uh, lots of fields. Right, so the, uh, the real problem seems to be that, that uh, this, this railway just cuts right through where it oughtn't to be, but it's definitely there in 1937. Uh, and about the only thing I could suggest is that what, would, uh, what would happen if you took it on into this area, or the hospital area, and put it on the ground and see what happens there? Good idea. And that's what we did that afternoon. This time, we led Jenny to the place where that 1937 map showed there had been a hospital. And there was still hesitation, still some doubt. The big door with the decorated stone lintel didn't seem to be there. The door wasn't on a, on a corner like that. It was on a... There it is. Was that a door? Could have been. The uh, stone was all these blocks. In the door we had a big heavy top part to it and it had the uh, flute bits all down the side. Right. You weren't too far wrong, there have been some changes. Let's see if you can get anything out of that. Oh yes, there. There's the door, that's, that's the main entrance. Okay. I can't yes, believe yes. it was there, I thought it was all wrong. Not knowing the changes the years had brought, she had described the doorway exactly. A door which had been made a window years ago. Quite John Abbott had to go back to London, but before he left us, he summed up his impressions. But uh, uh, in every way that I've, I've seen it, you know, there's no possibility that there could have been any fiddle-faddle. And uh, all I can really say on that area is if there had been fiddle-faddle, we'd have done a bit better than we did. <laughs> uh, started off very well. We uh, moved from the hotel we were staying in in Pionierstrasse. She led us uh, as if on strings pretty well directly and at great pace to the uh, to the uh, Feld uh, uh, Kirschfeldstrasse and straight to a house and said that's the house that's our house well who knows when we set off to, to check all this out uh, we'd found a, an 89 year old lady who lived in the house next door which is an original house uh, she'd lived all her life there her daughter had been born there would have been uh, 10 years old at the time that you were there no memories of any of the names and any of the people that you thought uh, that, that you could detect. We went hunting for a, uh, a hospital, uh, except there wasn't a hospital there. Uh, none of that really worked out. Some of the things you said, though, did work out, I thought. Now, the, the, the area, the street that you took us to was, was uh, heavily populated by Jewish families, substantial middle-class Jewish families. They were all rounded up in 1937 in November and taken away and taken a across to the other side of the Rhine to a place called Oberkassel. Uh, now you did describe Undertrance in Australia being taken away first to what you call the village for Jews. And you called it something like Alstadt or Alstadt. Well, to get up to uh, Oberkassel, you go through Alstadt, which means old city. So a deeper step backwards. Across the busyness of the Rhine, we took Jenny back to Oberkassel. She told us under hypnosis how the teenage Dorothy Harman's father, hearing that the Nazis were coming, had hidden her in a small and totally dark cupboard. It didn't save her. With all the Jews in that street, she was taken away and separated from her family. She managed to escape and hide in a cellar again in the dark. The fear, the loss and the darkness brought a strangeness into that young mind. And Jenny, under hypnosis in Dusseldorf, relived again that awful time. Taking me to my village for Jews. The buildings are old. Not a nice place. Different ones. 
experiment, and inconclusive perhaps, except for the details about the hospital, and for the unmistakable horror of a clear-minded woman filled with the emotions of a black and fearful ending to another life, in another place, in another time. in the relaxed atmosphere of Peter Ramster's rooms in Sydney gives no outward impression of wild imaginings. She's a very down-to-earth woman, untravelled, and with little knowledge of life in England, even modern life there. To her, the notion of any past life came only under hypnosis. And then, in trance, came the change, from now to then, from today in Australia to a life two centuries ago in the pastoral setting of England's West Country. Producer Brian Morris joined our on-camera team in the search for Gwen's past. Guided by the recordings of her memories under hypnosis, 
We tried first to locate the general area she'd talked about. Have you heard of Glastonbury? The Glaston. What about Taunton? In Barkins, Taunton. What are the other villages around your area so we can find you? Oh, it'd be, um, Alford. It'd be, uh, it'd be Blarton. It'd be, um, Stonechapel. Interesting names, but not there. Not on the most modern and large scale maps. So, to old ones, and older, and back to the 18th century ones, and suddenly the names began to leap out at us. Alford was there. Stone became Stone Chapel. And there was Horn Blotton, very close to the way she'd pronounced it. Now it was a matter of getting closer. Gwen's taped voice guiding our search was different somehow. Not the way she usually spoke. It was slower, accented. And there was an odd word she used. Uh, in cottage. Could you describe it for me? Small. Not big. A bit such roof. A bit room down. A tallet. A tallet? What was a tallet? No one in Australia seemed to know, and we couldn't find a reference book or a major dictionary with the answer. It went on puzzling us. A drying room. In England, we looked at cottages and houses all across and about the part of Somerset so clear in Gwen's mind, and none of them fitted her description. But she was remembering across a two-century gap, and things had changed. She was deep in some other life. What was your name? Mary Duncan, but they call me Rose. English Rose, they say. Tell me about your mother. What's your mother's name? Elizabeth. She died when I was born. What was your mother's maiden name? What family did she come from? Lethbridge, Bessie said. Have the temper of a Lethbridge. Temper of my grandfather. The search was twofold. Mm -hmm. Where had she lived? And was there fact in what she said under hypnosis? Did she make up unconsciously the names of her mother's family, the Lethbridges? And of the local gentry? Was there in that small pocket of Somerset a James Mackenzie whose name she recalled? A squire called Hugh Somerville? Consistently, the old books and registered showed she was right, even to her use of that strange and long obsolete word, talent. The uh, talent you were asking about. Really? really? West, um, West Somerset word book. Hayloft over a uh, stable. stable. Of course. Yes. Yes. Does that make sense in what you're looking for? Well, that seemed to have solved part of one problem. And we took the rest to an expert who was later to act as our witness. This Blossom or Blousen. And later on became Horn Blotton. So we're pretty convinced now that the uh, Blouton she talks about is Horn Blotton. Well, this is um, interesting because, in fact, the older form of Horn Blotton had um, an O sewn in it. So that uh, it looks as if uh, she is hitting on uh, an older form which has now been corrupted to Horn Blotton. So that's very satisfactory. But I'm, I'm convinced that there's, there's something in it. So what we're going to do now is to find where Gwen, as Rose Duncan, had lived, and to take that independent witness with us. Dr. Basil Cottle is reader in medieval studies in the English department of Bristol University. And he agreed with us that we should make another blindfold test. We took Gwen into the wide general area she'd described under hypnosis in Australia, the area we'd first begun to search. Dr. Cottle watching very carefully Gwen's every move studying her every word. Uh, 
That doesn't feel right that way. It's this way. And through the wood that way. I feel that that way. She was pointing to the area around Clanville, a place of few and scattered houses where she claimed there had been five shops. This flat piece here feels right. And this this curve. This curve here, I'm sure this is where they were. Sure this is where the shops were. On an old map, on that curve, five buildings show. Five cottage shops, perhaps. Well, around that bend, if you turn that way, I'm sure you'll come to the stream. A, around that bend. Stream. Oh, yes, it's water. It's water. I can feel it. And then you go across that. I think if you find a stream there, you'll, you'll, you'll see where it divides and you go across the, the, the stones, then you'll come to where I used to live. It wasn't that easy, not just a matter of walking there. Oh, yes, always. In the two centuries past, always. the country has been reshaped. Marshy land has been drained, woods have been cut and cleared, and fences have enclosed open land. But some things remain constant, like a watercourse, a river which Gwen had told us divided in a fork. And that's where she took us, to that river. Yes, I see. Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. Well, I reckon, down there. If you follow this down to the bottom, I think you'll come across the stepping stone. Dr. Cuffle, demanding but fair, summed up that far. I think that we have given Gwen very few uh, direct clues to what was being done. But I would emphasize that the test has been a wholly fair one. And I must say that I feel a little more persuaded than I did at the beginning of the proceedings. But my mind is still open. The next morning we renewed the search. Gwen had taken us to the watercourse, but we weren't yet close to where she'd lived. She was having some trouble finding her way without landmarks in a countryside so much altered. I, is, what's that over there? Well, that's where it was. I lived, if that's the wood, I lived here. Oh, and the wood was there. And it looks like a wood, Peter. Oh, it looks like... Is there a landmark or something else one would be able to recognise this spot from? Not far. About 20 minutes to walk from edge of wood. Be this side of stream be wood. Be not far. In the 18th century, the straight path from Clanville, which Rose Duncan used to follow, led her to the fork in the water and so to her cottage. Dr. Cottle, determined to put her to the test, said that if she knew where the river divided, she should take us along the line of the water. And Gwen, out of time as well as out of place, led us on a seven-mile walk. But then suddenly the scent grew strong, and she took us again to the sound of water buried in the greenery. Listen to the stream, This was the key to the puzzle for Gwen. This was where Rose Duncan had crossed the river to go to her cottage. Below a waterfall, the fork in the stream was there, just as she had said it would be. And she was off, moving with the purpose of someone who knows where she is and where to go. She led us unerringly now across fields and through nettle hedges in a beeline for a place we couldn't see. It was afternoon and Rose Duncan was on familiar ground. Home ground. I think maybe that could be it. Her mood changed in a sharp moment, almost to a little fear, as though the past was overwhelming her. And of all the houses we'd looked at and crossed off, she led us across country to the very first we had checked. It still seemed not to fit her description in any way at all, except perhaps for a loft. Was this her talent? 
It looked as though what she called her cottage was a barn alongside a newer house. But she insisted, and Dr. Cottle asked her to draw it as she remembered it. And this was, there was a door here, and a window here. Right? This, and the, the roof. Now, that's, that's the front. And looking from the back, on this side, there was a piece that came down, like that, like that, added on, and this in here was back to back with the fire that was inside and was used as a drying room. And you came through here into there. In here was our, what you call, everything room. And here would be like the bedroom. Go through there, there was a little room there that I had and out a back door. Then she led us around to what is now the back of the cottage. <laughs> My God. Oh, my God. There's even the little window. And once again, we saw the now familiar reaction of tears as the shock hit home. The doctor may have been moved, but that didn't sway his assessment of what we had found here in an old cottage in Somerset. It should be a door, but I don't think it is. I think it's a window and the door was closer. Well, the slightly, un slightly unsatisfactory thing is that there is supposed to be a door just to the right of this lean-to and a window towards the pine end. A window, in fact, which at one time lit the room in which Gwen slept. Uh, the door is now only a window, but admittedly it's got a great beam across that at one time might door. have accommodated the door. If Gwen was right, we should be able to see her bedroom window, but there was no sign of it from outside. Well, could we go inside possibly and see that? Now that she was at the cottage, Gwen knew where to go and what to expect inside. We went through what she said had been her father's bedroom. What do you think, Doctor? Uh, yes, I think it has been a bit renewed, but... Was there a, an upstairs? Yeah, tell us. That's so, the color. You uh -huh. can see. Yeah, kind of it's the old shape. Was that the wall there, Gwen? No, one big room. And see, there's. Yeah, this corner of the window. Can we? That was the. Yeah, that indeed was more or less the position of the window as you chose it. I think. Yeah. yeah look. You and indeed it was. The tendrils of the ivy covering the outside view couldn't hide the unmistakable shape or the massive rock and smaller stones used to block the light of that window for the past long years. Was this the right floor, Gwen? It was a stone floor. But it was done even like this. I suppose it's, it's sunk a, a bit over the, the years, years and that, but yeah. it, it wasn't uneven, it was even. Is that the same sort of floor as in Mr. Brown's cottage? Oh, no, it's, uh, they're, they're more or less, uh, well, similar, but more pockmarked, more marked. More rough, oh, yeah. Rough. The Mr. Brown's cottage mentioned was yet another part of our search. Mr. Brown and Rose Duncan had met near one of England's oldest and most famous landmarks, a place Gwen had spoken of under hypnosis in Sydney. You'll be able to see out, and I want you to tell me, where are you? Pretty happy. What's the name of the Abbey? St. Michael's Abbey. I'm taking stones out of at Michael's Abbey to put on floor. We shouldn't do that. Five miles away lies not St. Michael's, but Glastonbury Abbey, an ancient and plundered ruin even in the time of Rose Duncan. But the Abbey does lie in the shadow of St. Michael's Mount, crowned by the chapel of St. Michael. It took stones for floor and house. <sighs> I shouldn't touch stones. Did you see them move any stones at any time? No, oh, I. Mr. Brownie put stone on his floor. Gwen had told in trance of how Rose liked to visit the ruins of the Abbey, and how one day there she had cut her foot and been found hobbling by Mr. Brown, who lived a mile away on the far side. He'd taken her to his cottage and bathed and bandaged her injured foot, and she remembered him and his house for that kind act. Now she led us to where he had lived. There'd be five houses on one side of the street. 
That's it. Maybe the second one from the end. I'm sure that's it. Across that West of England stream, two cottages only remain of the original five. The cottages are possibly what Gwen remembers. They're in the right spot. They are near a river. Uh, they, I do believe, were once cottages, although they're now a um, little home for chickens and things. But uh, they are cottages, and we hear that uh, they once had a fireplace. Uh, Rose Cottage itself, if I can call it that, are now called Easton. Uh, well, when we arrived there, Gwen showed signs of distinct emotion which uh, might be convincing but need not be what convinces me much more is that she did give beforehand uh, a quite reasonable plan as it were of what it was going to look like she showed us a pent roof and windows in approximately the right places and the place uh, as a place 200 years old is fairly convincing one of the things that convinced me most was the her pronunciation of um, Hornblotten as Blorton, but I happen to know that that is the form of pronunciation, and I happen to believe that Gwen probably didn't have access to the fact that it was the form of pronunciation. I don't think either she or any informants in Australia could have told her that. But there's one word that she has used which could be a crucial proof uh, that she is really repeating something uh, heard in a previous existence, and that is the obsolete West Country word, a talent for a loft. So I think what remains now is for us to clean up the floor of this chicken house, which belongs to Jason's father here, <laughs> and then we shall see if the markings tally with the markings which Gwen remembered on stones brought into here by her friend Mr. Brown. Be fixed on square and spiral circle like and it had a spiral circle on the stone I in corner on right side and funny right and like cut in rock cut in stone to open your eyes and to stay to remain in trance I want you just to open your eyes, take the pen off me, and draw. Now this was something quite gripping. The markings she made were not writing, not anything formal. And that meant that if Gwen, under hypnosis, could see those strange and unique markings, and if we could find her stone, then we could either disprove her story or prove it solidly. <laughs> this was where we would find out, one way or the other. It was 24 hours later, and the floor of that poultry shed was clean of a century's dirt and droppings. Farmer Dennis Simmons had been surprised to find there was a stone floor in his shed, and the distinctive Glastonbury Abbey stone at that. And even more startled when Gwen found the particular stone she had said would be there. I think there was two. What are the odds against an Australian housewife in the late 20th century drawing under hypnosis the markings on a stone buried in England these hundreds of years and getting them anything like right? A million to one? <clears throat> the farmer's family watched unbelievingly and their look said at least a million to one there didn't at first seem to be any sign of Gwen's markings on the wet stone we dried it and brushed it with talcum powder it's like the top of Scotland coming in yes it is too see yeah. yes it's coming up well actually yeah. yeah see all these little curves and midges do you recognise anything else there yeah. Spiral, looks like a spiral. The original one was drawn in Sydney. Oh, right. oh right, it is close. Huh. You've got your thing, your arch there, you've got a little squiggle there, you've got a little squiggle there. You've got that curving around there, you have that curving around there. That's quite right, you do. It comes up and down, round, it comes up, it comes down, around and up, and it comes down and around again. Yeah. 
that again. You've got that quite clearly, that round ring there. And you've got a little squiggle like the start of a two there. So that's very, very close to what you draw. This is the way the stone looked to us and our camera. Let's make the markings as clear to you now as they seemed to us then on that day in that dark old shed. The stone and the drawing done in Sydney. However long those million to one odds seemed, the effect on farmer Dennis Simmons and his family was unmistakable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Did you mention that to anybody? No, we didn't say anything because we all thought you were mad. <laughs> Are we still mad? No, no, no. <laughs> Been there before, that is, in this life. But things start to change when you realize everything around you is familiar. You know, the buildings, the fields, the roads. And then you come across your home, the place where you lived in the 18th century. Gwen was an extraordinary story. Gwen was an extraordinary um, person, an extraordinary subject, and it was an extraordinary case history. I don't have any doubt whatsoever that she experienced previous lives. I've got no doubt whatsoever that's what it was. Somerset, England, 1981. This way. Gwen MacDonald seems to know this countryside intimately, as though She's lived here all her life. She has a past life, lived more than 200 years ago. Look at that little old house through there. She was a very down-to-earth person. She was a bit on the sceptical side. She wasn't... She's a person who calls a spade a spade, you know. I don't believe for one minute that she made it up or, or went out and researched and secretly uh, found, tried to find out facts. Peter Ramster is a psychologist. Jean MacDonald is Gwen's daughter-in-law. Together, they've worked on this jigsaw that spans continents, cultures, centuries. This story, the lives and times of Gwen MacDonald. Not far. Sad. It all began in 1979. Peter Ramster was interviewing potential subjects for an age regression experiment. Among them, a very reluctant Gwen MacDonald. She didn't want to be in it, but I sort of talked her into it and uh, <clears throat> with a bit of cajoling. And she came up and she sat down in the chair and I said, well, look, we'll just do a test, just to just see if you can be hypnotised, you know. So she said, all right, but that's all, you know, and she was going on about this no parlour games business. And um, anyway, she went out like a light. She was great. I was in Egypt. Under hypnosis, Gwen began to reveal her hidden past. A past that, session after session, month after month, was recorded on videotape. So how many lives, total lives is that? 11, 12. A dozen past lives, lived by an average woman, a mother, a grandmother, not a psychic, Certainly no dabbler in the paranormal. He was an old man. A young child. In the same country. Gwen MacDonald was able to recall how, when and where she lived and died. In Egypt, Turkey, Canada, Australia and England. Most fascinating, though, were the memories of one particular life. The place, Somerset. The time, around 1770. The life, Rose Duncan's. A young woman who lived in a small stone house near historic Glastonbury Abbey. Rose Cottage. Going towards stream. She told of places, uh, villages that I couldn't find on the maps, 
So I went back to older and older maps and finally when I got back to sort of 18th century maps, there these places were. Um, and so I took it as far as I could possibly take it in Australia and then decided to, to ask her if she'd go overseas and do a real expedition to find out the truth one way or the other. It was Gwen McDonald's first time in England, at least in this life. And a camera crew was there to film the visit. In Somerset, Gwen was blindfolded. There was no way she could get her bearings. To her, it should have been an alien land, but it wasn't. They took her to a certain a spot in a town. She didn't know where she was, right? They opened the door of the car. She got out. They took the blindfold off. They said, OK, um, do you know where you are? And she looked around. OK, we'll go this way. Months before, under hypnosis, Gwen had recalled landmarks in the village where she lived as Rose Duncan. In particular, a tavern, the Pilgrim Inn. It's a coach inn. It's got a hole in the middle where the coaches go. In Somerset, Gwen led them straight to a busy street. And there it was, the old inn. See the little windows? Look. Yeah. See how you describe them, the little long windows. Right. And the other ones in the middle, and the brickwork. What did you call it, Gwen? Do you remember? Pilgrim's Inn. You didn't put George in, did you? No. no. It was exactly as she had drawn it, um, even out of the smallest detail. The only difference being it was called the Georgian Pilgrim. So I checked it out and I found that in 1792 it was called the Pilgrim's Inn. Next, the cottage Gwen had described in detail. The one where Rose Duncan used to live. Stone floor. Not just any stone floors. Gwen told Peter Ramster they were distinctive stone slabs, stolen from Glastonbury Abbey. So he gave her a piece of paper while she was under hypnosis, and she drew these markings. It was like three straight lines on, along the top, and then a, a squiggly circle. She told me that the house the stones were put in was 20 feet from a stream, well, she took us first to a stream. She said, oh, this will be the stream. We walked along the stream, and then she pointed at this place. And she said, that's it. I'm sure that's it. <laughs> Rose Cottage. It did date back to the 1700s. It had been occupied by a family called Duncan. And what of the cottage floor? It was encrusted with centuries of dirt and grime. And uh, when they'd cleaned it, of course, here were all these stones all over the floor, from Glass uh, identical to the stones on the floor in Glastonbury Abbey. Just as Gwen had described them, months before, half a world away, even down to the markings in the corner. We were all there in a country none of us knew. We didn't have a clue where, where we were. And here's this woman who's never been to the country, knowing her way around as if she'd been there all her life. Very kind. Gentle people. Fragments recalled. Piece by piece, they fit together. They reveal a picture of Rose Duncan's life. A life Gwen MacDonald lived more than 200 years ago. It changed all our lives. And everybody that she came in contact with, she changed their lives too. Not just here, all over the world. Well, I think the work with Gwen shows that reincarnation's a fact. I, I wouldn't have said that once, but I, I do believe that now. Eight years after that voyage into the past, that voyage of discovery, Gwen MacDonald died from a brain tumour, leaving behind the memories the mysteries of her life, her lives on Earth. I've only just sort of let her go, I think. It's nearly six years, but I did let her go. A few weeks ago, said goodbye. And um, I know she's fine. I'll see her again someday.
I hope so. Explain yeah. reincarnation by saying that it is fantasy or genetic memory or something that they've read in a book. I don't believe it's fantasy because, for a start, the film deals in fact, not fantasy. Uh, it can't be genetic memory because people don't go down the same genetic line as their own ancestry. And as far as books are concerned, well, people could have read some of it in books, but I don't believe they could have read all the information that this film has brought out. Well, where does the truth lie? Religions of all kinds teach us about an afterlife. Some of them speak of a limbo, a timeless place of waiting to achieve something higher. And some speak of reincarnation itself, of a rebirth on the human plane after physical death. These are ancient and deep-rooted beliefs in all mankind. And science is now acknowledging how little we know of life beyond the body, the life of the mind. About its ability to recall, to project, to contact other minds. About its ability to survive. Is that what it is then? If reincarnation exists, is it the survival of the human mind? A power source unwilling to be switched off when the body dies and looking for another outlet? And if not, then what? What makes ordinary people make the extraordinary claim that they've lived before? Perhaps it's the universal desire not just to finish, not simply to accept that it's all over. The universal hope that there's more to come, and something better at that. And the human craving to know. To know whether there's anything after death and if there is what is it and where is it you to begin to relive now the point just after you died and you feel yourself going to wherever it was that the man took you after you talked to him for dorothy Hellman, it was heaven and a loving reunion and walking along just walking along the road and see his nickel. His papa. His papa. Papa! 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 One final question, who were you before?